With us uh, this morning in uh, the first panel is uh, the Federal Minister for Constitutional Affairs, Reforms, Deregulation and Justice uh, in the Austrian uh, government. Uh, it's uh, Bundesminister Josef Moser and I would like uh, to warmly welcome him here. As René Dobatka yesterday mentioned, uh, Minister Moser uh, was uh, for 12 years the president of the Court of Auditors uh, in uh, Austria, so he has a long time experience in uh, some of the questions may be raised uh, today. I also would like to welcome the first Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, Marit McGuinness, who already was uh, with us uh, yesterday, and uh, she also will give us a keynote a speech uh, on the topic. So without uh, any further ado, I would like to ask uh, Minister Moser to give us uh, his uh, presentation. So, chairs, ladies and gentlemen, the European, European Union, which is close to the citizens, will build mutual trust. And this is necessary in terms of our values common to the European Union in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. Over the last years, there have been developments which have damaged mutual trust within the European Union. I think, for example, on non-compliance with the Dublin Regulation in 2015 and non-compliance with the Maastricht criteria during the, the financial crisis and also contravention of the rule of law in individual states. There's also over-regulation, however. We have at the moment 21,000 EU directives and 85 pages of a key. And this puts off the citizens and creates distrust. Therefore, we have to strengthen trust in Europe once again. So, I mean the trust between the member states, but also the trust from the side of the citizens in the European Union. And we have to, we can do that by bringing our action at European level closer to the citizens. And we can only do that if our day-to-day -day political action is focused upon the benefits it brings the individual citizens. So in my point of view, we need to do this in order to strengthen confidence in the Union. Our focus as, as the Austrian presidency is a Europe which protects. And this includes meaning protecting by protecting prosperity and our competitiveness, but also security in the neighborhood of the EU. It also means that we have to handle, uh, deal with our environment in a sustainable way. In the area of justice, it shows how important a unified Europe is. We can only meet the expectations invested in us if we work together. And this, so every year, there are 3.5 uh, border crossings which take place every year. And in justice, then we have laid down new priorities, the strengthen of security in Europe by improving the rule of law, or standards for the rule of law, strengthening Europe as a location for business through the digital single market, and also increasing security in the EU neighborhood. And this is particularly important, this latter, in terms of the West Balkans. So we are working on 30 dossiers during the presidency. I can't talk about all of them, but allow me to touch on a few of them. So in terms of security in Europe, it's very important to fight organized crime, and terrorism. As we know, that these are no respecters, uh, do not respect our national borders. And therefore, it's very important that there is cooperation between member states. And it's also absolutely essential that the uh, criminal investigation authorities work together. So we have uh, regulations on money laundering. So the first important steps have been taken. 
So the rules on money laundering have to be unified across the member states, and in the future there will be minimum standards in place. In this way we can prevent forum shopping, which means that criminal parties won't find differences between different member states, and they won't be able to use these differences to their, such differences to their advantage. And that means it will be possible to fight organized crime more efficiently. Another issue for security is the ECRIS system. So if we want to increase the security for our citizens, we need to have a solution for the proposals on ECRIS as soon as possible. ECRIS is very important for identifying criminals it allows information to be shared across borders. At the moment, this is not comprehensive enough. And this means that uh, EU citizens uh, who have a criminal record, this is recorded, but not perhaps for uh, those which are, have a dual nationality. And it means that in some cases they are able to move, people are able to move between the member states and, and uh, to cover up a criminal past by doing so. And this is important for uh, that we can identify state, uh, stateless individuals and third country individuals. And this is very important so that we can make it clear which uh, people are innocent and have no criminal record. So we owe this to people. As parliamentarians, we have to take this uh, product on, this issue on, and I ask you to support this dossier. At the moment, the negotiations are going through the European Parliament so that hopefully we will be able to come to a successful conclusion before the European elections. We are also dealing with e-evidence and cyber criminality, also uh, hate speech in the internet and also child pornography. It is true that there is electronic data needed for uh, increasingly for criminal activities. And this means that we have to uh, fight terrorism in this way, drug dealing, and fraud. Criminality knows no borders, and so we also need to use modern technology and cross-border uh, options in order to be able to fight. And this, these, and this is why e-evidence is so important. So it will now be possible, the, we are working on a situation whereby we can ask for e-evidence uh, requested cross-border. We have to meet, however, the, the correct balance because the objective is that we should also have an agreement in Council in December. We've had a minister, ministerial summit uh, in November with the USA, and we've already uh, managed to start negotiations with the USA. So I ask the Commission to be, uh, to be swift in putting forward a uh, negotiations mandate so that in December this can be approved so that the negotiations can be begun. So I ask you to support us so that the European Commission should act. A further measure for uh, security is the Brussels 2A regulation. At the present time, it is uh, not acceptable that we have a situation we have to protect families and children, and when children uh, are kidnapped, and sometimes it takes years to, to return them to their families. So when children are abducted, it should be 18 weeks as, as a, a limit. We, are, we owe this to the families and to the children that we act very quickly in returning these children to their families. A further point is strengthening uh, Europe as a business location. We need a, um, a state aid regulation. So there are 200,000 insolvencies every year in Europe, and in this case, uh, there are many jobs which are lost. We also need to have a regulation in place for insolvency, because we, if there are, is a situation sometimes where businesses run into trouble, although they are viable businesses, and we want to 
ensure that those jobs are not lost and we want to strengthen uh, our economies. We also need to have a properly uh, interconnected digital single market. And this is an important milestone. Also, greening, uh, if we need modern communication facilities in order to green our uh, companies. We need digital communication, and this is how we can move digitalization forward and make Europe more competitive. For me, something very close to my heart is uh, rule of law and the standards relating to the rule of law. There is increasingly, it's increasingly clear that there is more need for action, and with my fellow ministers in the EU, we want to improve once more the trust between the member states. We need judicial cooperation for criminal law. We also need recognition of judgments. And this also, in order to have that, we have to ensure that we have confidence in each other's systems. So in July, there was an informal meeting of the justice uh, ministers, also in the West Balkan Conference in October. And there have been many bilateral discussions with my ministerial colleagues across the EU. And we have moved these issues forward. This is a central issue, and the question arises of what tasks and what responsibilities uh, belongs within the judicial area. And we have to ensure that European instruments are mutually recognized so that they can have full effect. And this means we have to have uh, unified standards and a unified rule of law. Only then can instruments for example, European arrest, warrant, be uh, implemented fully. In reality, these are often not recognized as they should be. So, this also has to be said that in Greece, in Romania, in Hungary, in Bul Bulgaria, that the conditions in prisons are not uh, in keeping with the fundamental charter on human rights. So, in an Irish, there was an Irish procedure, uh, and there was uh, the independence of the judicial systems of member states was, was called into question. And this causes a risk that there will be a, a violation of rights during cr criminal proceedings, and this means that it's not possible to extradite under a European arrest warrant. And this means that we want to ensure that this system works once more. It's necessary that the rule of law should be strengthened across Europe and that the, uh, uh, the standards are unified. This is a task for the this is not a task for the European Commission, this is a task for the member states themselves. And there will be a focus, there will be an expert conference at the 30th of November, and we will be working on this. This is together, this is an event organized together with the European Commission, and in this area, we will also involve our partners from the West Balkans and from the Eastern Partnership. So there will be specific uh, action that we will wish to take in December. And this has, was also an issue for the co uh, conference in Albania in November. And this, uh, the focus here is to strengthen stability in the European neighborhood. So the support of standards for rule of law, but also we, have dis we discussed different ways in which uh, we can measure judicial reform. And I emphasize here that all states in the West Balkans are making great efforts to reform uh, in their judicial 
systems and to become closer to the EU. So we are committed to this to support rule of law within the EU and to increase confidence in this way. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you for your support, because only if we uh, work together, we can create confidence in our uh, systems and bring the EU closer to the citizens. And in this uh, respect, we also need to deregulate. It's already been touched upon. And this will create greater efficiency. So at a European level, it is necessary that the, these tasks should be carried out in the European Union at the right level, so as close as possible to the citizens. Action at the EU level must not be for its own sake. It should only be required where certain tasks can be better carried out at a European Union level. Otherwise, they should be carried out at a national level. In Europe, we will only be strong if we work together with the big issues and we leave the decisions to the member states for the small issues. That means we need more subsidiarity, more proportionality. And I'm very pleased that the European, uh, that the Austrian presidency ran an event in Bregenz to focus on subsidiarity. With, uh, and the, the strategy uh, paper was put forward uh, to work, to do less, but to do it more efficiently. And so allow me to give you a quote which I thought about as I was looking at the European flag with the, the 12 uh, stars. Stephen Hawking said before his death, he was, despite uh, the very negative pro prognosis for him, he also always remained very positive. He said, remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Moser, for your keynote address, also mentioning the Western Balkans, also mentioning subsidiarity and proportionality issues, uh, and uh, also doing less more efficiently. Um, we are proceeding in our program. Uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to Marit uh, McGuinness, first Vice President of the European Parliament. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Minister, for your final words that I shall look at the stars and not at my feet. Um, you did mention an important word in your speech, and that is trust. But I think that it isn't just an issue of trust between European Union and citizens, but trust in politics generally that is at stake here. And sometimes we uh, assign this lack of trust only to the European Union, but look at our own member states and look at the uh, criticism of politicians and sometimes the unjustified attacks on politicians, both verbal and indeed physical. And I think we have an issue about our own profession and how citizens perceive us. We perhaps might talk about that later in the conversation. I'm happy to be involved here today because uh, this issue is close to my heart. We're standing, and I hope to stand, in the European elections next year. We're talking about how we can make Europe closer to the people and more transparent. So I'm going to start with transparency. And we think of it in terms of how the institutions deal with being more transparent. It's a concept that has evolved uh, since Maastricht. Um, and I think we have a different understanding of it today than we had in its earlier uh, manifestations. It is about openness, it's access to information. Uh, and I think um, in my own experience, I really have never been asked by a citizen about transparency because it's a term we use, it's almost an academic term, but they want to know more about Europe and they want to know how it works. Uh, and I think that if we think in those terms, we might be better able to relate to how people feel about Europe and how we might make that a, a stronger, uh, more inclusive feeling. So openness is really important, and I think the European Parliament has been a guiding light in terms of being open and transparent. And I think that's essential because we are the only directly elected institution of the European Union, and therefore we are, um, if you like, held to account by the citizens who directly elect us. We're also very open to the many groups, NGOs, lobbyists, etc., who come to us on various pieces of legislation. So we do operate on a very transparent basis. And as I said, there has been a strong evolution towards greater transparency. 
I know it's a key issue for you as members of national parliaments, and indeed this issue of uh, EU level transparency needs to be complemented by what's happening at the national level in terms of transparency. And I would say that governments, yours and mine, need to provide more information to the public and to their parliaments. And you as elected members of parliament can hold your government to account. Transparent parliamentary procedures in all our member states can make national EU policies visible and more accessible to citizens. Transparency in the EU institutions cannot replace this. So we do have to work together if we are to strengthen this uh, concept of transparency and indeed, indeed uh, how it actually operates at the member state level. As you know, we're upgrading the transparency register uh, between the Parliament and the Commission. This also will assist. Um, the Commission it, you know, has launched uh, under Article 11 of the Treaty a very wide-ranging consultation and dialogues with civil society, so this is ongoing. Um, this week, the AFCO Committee of the Parliament, which is chaired by my colleague Danuta Hubner, will vote on a report on Europe, the European Ombudsman recommendations for increased transparency in the Council. So you have an ally in the European Parliament when it comes to these issues. The Dutch and Danish parliaments will find a lot of support for their arguments uh, in this report. Um, if you look at what can trans transparency can and cannot do, um, I'm not so sure that it can answer all the questions about the complexity of how we make decisions. Um, and to some extent, what I think our citizens want are results at EU level and to understand why policies come at, at the EU level uh, and then are translated into national policies. Um, and this leads me to uh, the question of subsidiarity and the Minister's um, remarks around deregulation, tasks being assigned to the, the right level. Let me give you an example of two rather recent uh, issues. You will all be familiar with the scandals in the medical devices industry some years back, um, which the medical devices sector was governed by a directive and when we looked at what was happening there, we realized we needed a regulation. So we actually needed that the European Union had stronger control because this industry affects the health and lives and quality of life of all our citizens. Uh, and in that case, uh, we all agreed that progress and change was required in order to guarantee uh, the safety of our citizens, our patients who um, go into hospital, um, have a medical device fitted, and want to come out um, alive and well. And in many cases, we had some uh, awful examples of what was happening there and threatening the, the quality of life of our citizens. So we changed from a more, um, if you like, member state approach to a stronger approach at EU level. That legislation is currently being implemented um, and we uh, hope to see it fully implemented in all its aspects because it is for the betterment of all our citizens. Let me give you another example that's currently being discussed at EU level, which is reform of our agriculture policy. Uh, and indeed, uh, my good friend, a former MEP, um, Elizabeth Costinger, will be leading on this issue. She was in the European Parliament and she's now the uh, minister responsible. And if you look at the Commission's proposal, it is actually offering to give to the member states greater control of implementation of agriculture policy. But what has happened, at least in my experience, is that member states and indeed farmers and citizens are not so sure that they want the individual member states to have such greater control, that perhaps having the European Union level control is a better option. So sometimes when we look for something and it is offered, there is a reaction which suggests we weren't sure what we were looking for. So I think we need to be conscious that in different policy areas there may be uh, an appropriate level of decision making um, than in others and perhaps that's a discussion that we do need to have. That said, and it was uh, the remarks were made yesterday, when it comes to national elections, uh, people are more engaged and engrossed because it is about the here and now. Very often the work we do in the European Parliament is not just about the here and now, it is about the long term. So in a previous life, before I came to politics, there were issues like the nitrates directive about water quality, which seemed so far removed and away from us uh, when I was a citizen. 
that you now realize these were vital issues and somebody had to lead on them. And the Commission, through its proposals, was leading on these things ahead of perhaps where member states were, at least some. But we needed that, if you like, shining light so that we would all move in the direction towards uh, better um, water quality in this case, or indeed as yesterday's discussion focused on better air quality. So there are issues where if it were left to individual member states, and these issues cross borders, um, you can't stop the air or the water flowing, we would not get a coherent uh, response or indeed coherent action. So yes to subsidiarity where it is appropriate, but we do need to define very clearly where subsidiarity is appropriate. My own experience of Parliament is that it would be wonderful if we all engaged on policies as they are initiated rather than when they're in their final stage. Very often, and I say this in my own, to my own colleagues in, in my Parliament, um, members come to me when we are about to sign off on legislation but have not been in touch at the outset. So we do have to challenge ourselves as to how we work as parliamentarians collectively in order that we uh, avoid problems um, at the end stage of legislation. Because very often when I'm hearing from national parliaments on pieces of legislation that would have been debated over years, not weeks or hours, but over years at the European Union level, one would wonder do we have any communication tools at all because it would appear that some of the debate falls on deaf ears. It is also true that Europe is a useful um, a, a place of attack. And indeed, I think we can all be guilty that we can accuse the European Union because it is a, an anonymous, if you like, place of you know, being at fault when it comes to issues and praise the member state level uh, for its work. Um, and I think neither are true. I think the European Union is not without fault. The Commission and indeed Parliament, all parliaments are, are, are you know, not perfection. Um, but I do think that the common good is well served by the policies that are initiated at a European Union level. Perhaps the failure is in how we communicate the ideal behind a policy and how we implement that. Because very often there are sections of our society that are impacted quite severely by some of our policies. Indeed, yesterday's climate action might be one of those areas. And it can be quite difficult to say to one group in society, well, you, you will suffer, your job might go, because it is better overall for the future of our planet. The here and now matters. So I do think that um, in my experience of COSAC, you know, this is a really important platform for me to listen to your concerns about the EU level legislative process um, and for you to understand, as I've said at the very outset of my engagement with COSAC and my responsibility for dialogue with national parliaments, we are not in opposition. We are all elected and we have a duty to work effectively together so that we have a common vision for a better Europe. Let me get on to the topic of the European Parliament elections, um, which will happen next May. Um, I mean, these are interesting times, not least because we have had um, the vote from the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. And if there is any positives to come out of uh, that issue, it is that there has been more discussion and indeed interest and awareness of what the European Union is. There are many people who now understand what a customs union is, what the single market does, what freedom of movement actually means. I think these were terms that people heard but didn't quite grasp how uh, important they are, how fundamental they are to our freedoms as citizens within the European Union. So while I, I like many, I, I'm, I'm quite upset about the reality of Brexit and respect to the vote in the United Kingdom, it has given many countries, and indeed in my own uh, case, I, I'm an Irish um, member of the European Parliament, it has given us pause for thought to better understand what our, um, the creators, those who had vision of the past, wanted for the European Union, which is a union where people of different cultures, of diverse views, can actually work together. It's complicated, and I don't think we can simplify uh, the, the way we do business um, all that significantly, but on the overall principle of the value of working together, 
I think that the debate around Brexit has shown us um, and given a better understanding to our citizens about what Europe is, what it does, and what might happen uh, should it uh, fracture. And I think on that issue, we should be very clear to our citizens that nothing is certain and nothing is forever unless we work together to make it thus. Uh, and not everyone agrees with uh, the European Union being strengthened, but I think a majority do agree that the European Union has added value to us as countries and as individual citizens. So I think when we go towards the European elections, I know in my own country, and perhaps it is for other uh, members of the European Parliament, national politics is usually quite dominant, so whatever the issue is nationally can be to the fore. Perhaps these are the first European elections where European issues, like rule of law, like migration, like security, climate, will be to the fore, because on those questions, people are looking for answers and they know that they will come not just from the national level, but from a coordinated European Union response. So while we all look forward, I think, as elected um, politicians, it with some trepidation to all elections, I think we should look forward to these ones, uh, the next European elections, as an opportunity to talk about the European Union and to challenge those who would attack its very foundations. I think this is an opportunity we should seize with open arms. We should also encourage people to vote. And really, I appeal and ask you, as elected members of your parliaments, close to your own citizens, to encourage people to vote in the European elections. Uh, they are regarded, to some extent, as the second-level elections. There is more focus on national politics, but perhaps this time you would work with us in the European Parliament to make the European elections as vital as national elections are, because we are not sure of the political mix of the next Parliament. I have the, um, the honour of chairing Parliament uh, on many occasions and chairing votes, and it is becoming increasingly obvious that at the either ends of the parliamentary uh, politics, on the right and on the left, increasingly there is a move that they vote in the same way. So it isn't just about I ideology, there are other things at play here. So we need to say to people that your vote matters in the European elections. We also will have the Spitzen Kandidaten uh, um, approach that will be interesting to see how it evolves uh, in, in the elections that will come. Um, again, people are aware of it, but they're not as tuned into it as we as politicians are. So we need to humanize that concept, explain why it's important, and in that way bring people closer to us. I have to say that I'm one of the directly elected members of the European Parliament, so I'm not on a list. Um, I have got to go out and appeal to my citizens, which is why I work all hours, because at, at the end of the day, if those of us who have a passion for collective action at the EU level, of working together uh, despite our differences. If we're not prepared to do the work on the ground, uh, to walk the roads, to knock on the doors, to talk about how positive the European Union is, then who else will do it? And I think that those of us who are directly elected feel this very passionately. Um, and that's why these elections are particularly significant. We do have an initiative um, in the Parliament where we will have a website telling citizens about what Europe means to them. But I think as politicians we should also be brave enough to say to citizens, you have a responsibility. Sometimes we perhaps want to hand everything over as if all is well and make things look um, you know, calm and whatever. And the truth of the European Union and of the wider global politics is it is much more difficult and much more complex. I think our citizens are open to understand and realize that the, this is the situation. And lastly, if I may just make some remarks on communication and things like um, fake news and social media. Um, you know, there is so much access to information now. Our biggest difficulty is making sure that the information we all use and our citizens receive is fit for purpose. Um, there's been some interesting conversations about the use of think tanks, who funds them, 
Um, should we just take their conclusions as gospel or should we be a little bit more critical? And I think that I've been very impressed with um, our Parliament's Ambassador School Programme, for example. I, was in, I visited a school uh, in the last week where um, young students, 16 years of age, are engaging in this programme, learning about the European Union and its institutions, and very interested in those complex issues which the Minister addressed in his, his speech and which I have also mentioned in mine, and asking really good questions about that. So if we're to make and engage with citizens, it may be too late to, to start with a, an older generation whose minds are made up, but we certainly can talk to a younger generation um, and allow them have a debate. Uh, this is not about just telling people what they should believe, but encouraging people to understand the complexity of the world we live in and of the European Union that we have built thus far and that we want to continue building to strengthen not just the institutions, but the engagement of people with those institutions. I mentioned that to some extent um, in our busy lives as ordinary citizens, we just want society to work. We want things to happen. We want the rule of law to apply. Um, you know, often when my car breaks down, um, which I does on occasion, I'm not sure how to fix underneath. So what I really want is that I have a very good engineer who makes sure my car never breaks down and that the engine uh, works along uh, perfectly smoothly. And to some extent, when people lead busy lives, they also want to make sure that the institutions of Europe don't continue to agonize constantly um, within our, our sphere, but make sure that these institutions work for people not just for the politicians who are in there, but work for people on the ground and that they can become closer to them. I have to say that I think I am close to my citizens. Maybe they will react otherwise, because I believe if I weren't, I wouldn't be elected. And therefore, I think that there are many members of this um, gathering here who are also very close to your citizens. But all citizens are not the same. So I am close to some citizens who support my perspective, and I dare say not close to others. And that is the complexity of politics, ladies and gentlemen, that we cannot be close to everybody, but we should know what we want to achieve. And I hope in this gathering, what we want to achieve is a strengthening of our ability to work together despite our differences. And a reevaluation, a reevaluation rather, and a refocus on two words, solidarity and compromise. They've gone out of uh, focus a little. We need to bring them back into the frame. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice uh, President, uh, for your keynote address, uh, also for your commitment on uh, transparency and uh, bringing the European uh, Union and its institutions closer to its citizens. Colleagues, we are now moving on uh, to our debate. We already have uh, 39 speakers, so please hold uh, your remarks within two minutes sharply. The first speaker will be from the Netherlands, Peter Amchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for all being very passionate about transparency. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, you already mentioned our initiative on transparency from the Danish and the Dutch parliament. And in the last 24 hours, it appears that the Italian and Czech parliaments will join us. Because we don't just talk about transparency, we have to do it. And the big black hole is still the council. If the council makes a law, we still don't know what our own governments deliberate within the European Council. That is really bad for democracy, because it means that we have European elections or we have national elections, European laws are directly applicable to our national uh, laws, and they actually go above our national laws, but we're not allowed to see the deliberations in the decision-making body, which is the Council. It makes laws. So we made four recommendations last year, um, which are still in here, and we still have copies, and we asked the other Parliament to join our initiative. Because together we can make this transparency work, not just talk about it. The European Parliament takes a very good initiative on the lobby register. That's one problem which should be tackled. But we're taking another initiative. And if it is not public, I mean, imagine this is the equivalent, this is the equivalent of your Parliament 
deliberating behind closed doors and not telling your voters what you voted. And then you go back to the elections and, and say to your voters, well, I did a great job. The essence of our work is that it's open. So please join me in making sure that these four proposals are being put back on the table. Because whatever letters we got on the last um, few months, none of them actually replied point by point to the four proposals we made. Worse even, the European Ombudsman found maladministration, which is the most severe criticism she can give of any institution, and she gave that to European Council, and European Court of Justice found that the intransparency actually violates the treaty. So we're in good company, we have expert reviews, and let's go on and work with it, and please um, make yourself heard to the Dutch or Danish Colleague, two minutes, please. Thanks very much. Next uh, is Jean Bizet from France. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. Might I just recall that it, for years now we've talked about bringing Europe closer to citizens. The least one can say is that we haven't much to show for it. Apart from lamenting protectionist forces in one other country. And yesterday, in our debate on Brexit, we mentioned the economic dimension of Europe. Well, we can be pleased that in the course of time we've come to constitute the greatest market in the world. That's not enough. I'm pleased that in spite of everything, well, I mentioned to the European Social of Rights, De nos concitoyens. Il faut véritablement but if we want nous en really to attract our citizens, we need to build on a Europe of solidarity. And think about yesterday, the multi-annual financial framework, where we need to think about the aspect of cohesion, because that is part of the answer, part of the solution to try and bolster our policies. Let me mention the crucial role of national parliaments. We need to think about subsidiarity. Well, the Commission must grasp that it needs to act more precisely, more swiftly to concerns raised by national parliaments, and I regret that the actions delegated are not part of the consideration by national parliaments, and a task force perhaps is rather insensitive to that, and I also regret, if I can put it that way, the non-effectiveness of uh, this particular measure, which needs to require a third of national parliaments, and will never be called upon in this way to look at compromises which have come out of negotiations between co-negotiators. So I think there's an awful lot to be done before we achieve genuine transparency. Thank you. Next, Milan Biaglia, Slovenia. Um, Thank you very much. Well, for me also, transparency is one of the most important questions that we're facing in the European Union, but not just for one institution, no. The question arises for quite a number of them. Council traditionally is the most closed of the institutions, and I'm concerned about three major things here. One was already mentioned. Uh, namely the fact that the level of implementation or the level that is supposed to execute laws makes the laws themselves, that's one thing. And the other thing is that people say something in Brussels and something totally different at home, which means that the citizens really can't identify with the European Union. And then the interest of member states is mainly that uh, they want to be protected against uh, things which are bigger than what they can protect against at national level. That's 
what they expect from organizations. They join an organization to make sure that they have this protection. If we cannot ourselves clarify things uh, with the European Union, what was done here for subsidiarity and uh, proportionality, of course, is welcome, but we'll have to see in practice what of this can be implemented and how many of the results that were achieved can be really implemented. But it's not just the European Union and the European European Parliament, national Parliament, have to put their knowledge into this process as well. However, I have to say that I would expect that the Commission would do more. The Commission made many promises, but there was nothing very concrete that was actually achieved. Transparency is obviously part of a bigger problem, the democratic deficit, and this democratic deficit cannot be filled as long as the conditions for democracy to function are not fulfilled, uh, namely law, uh, respect of human rights, and as long as uh, the European Court of uh, Justice, the European Court of Thanks, Audit, uh, and the Court of Human Laws are not really complied with. Thank you, Chair. So first of all, thank you very much for placing this onto our agenda. And thank you for the conference in Bregenz, because there we have already been able to discuss the issue of subsidiarity and proportionality. And also to, to talk about the Timmermans report. We were also able to discuss cooperation between individual uh, parliaments and the European Parliament, and to throw light upon that. So, subsidiarity and proportionality. Well, it's a question about how political act action can be um, initiated. So the states have agreed that they will uh, hand competence over. It wasn't the treaties that took competence away from the citizens. Rather, the, ci the treaties put together a mechanism for putting, bringing the citizens closer to Europe. So, various representatives from the regions and the cities are also able to sit around the table with each other, and there's been an organization about since the beginning of the two, uh, 2000s, but we see again and again that the responsibility it, although it lies with the member states, it's not, that's not made clear at a, at a political level. And the, the governments at home are trying to draw all confidence, uh, uh, everything which is positive or positive news they, they want to have written on their own account. And then everything which doesn't work out too well, they want to push that over to the European, uh, uh, European level. And so it's quite clear that the euro barometer shows that the citizens generally speaking, retain confidence in the European Union. They trust the European institutions more than the national ones at, like at all uh, levels. Uh, so, colleagues, time. I would like to remind you. Two minutes, so please respect the speaking time. Our next speaker is uh, Richard Holczyk uh, from Hungary. Thank you, the floor, Mr. Chairman. Speaking about the elections, I cannot fail to mention <coughs> the particular role of the legitimacy and representation. In my country, the average partic participation of the uh, national parliament elections is far about 60 percent, whereas in the case of the European elections, the rate has been falling ever since the first direct election. The great majority of the Hungarian citizens, more than before, clearly support the European Union membership of Hungary and recognize its benefits. As far as I see, Mr. Chairman, the other member states' citizens have similar position. However, it 
if it comes to the European elections, the majority of the European Union citizens simply do not go to the polls. Our particular mission is to regain the trust of citizens, as Vice President McGuinness mentioned in the remarkable lecture. On the transparency, highly appreciate the efforts of the Austrian presidency, as well as the initiative of the Dutch and the Danish parliaments to ensure more transparency in the European legislative process. And as a final remark to the chairman, let me inform you that the Hungarian government has organized several national consultations with Hungarian citizens on pressing, pressing issues like currently, for instance, the democratic challenges. In addition, the government has recently organized forums on the future of Europe throughout the country. Such initiative serves, I believe, citizens to get better informed ahead of European elections which should bring about fundamental institutional renewal next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Elvira Kovac, Serbia. Thank you, distinguished chair and dear colleagues. I would like to bring to your attention the importance of the term of inclusion, since I'm confident that the answer to the issue, how to overcome democracy deficit in the functioning of the EU, how to overcome the lack of confidence in the EU institutions lies actually in that word. The surveys confirm that one state or one region can be prosperous only if the institutions are transformed from the closed and exclusive to the inclusive ones, open to wide economic and political participation. I think that the inclusion represents one of the key principles we must proceed from from in the process of redefining of the European policies. Actually, it is the level of inclusion, exclusion, the level of civic participation, which strengthens the political community, strengthens social cohesion and horizontal ties between various minority and social groups. The United Europe project could be described only if the gap between the political decision makers and citizens is eliminated. If the inclusion policies and policies of inclusion of all minorities, communities are strengthened. A society which will enable social, vertical and horizontal mobility is the society that will definitely defeat populism and all accompanying manifestations. Only inclusive community can win the fear and then prejudices. Prejudices are probably invincible, but pale, and they are pale in the community which is open and not full of ghettoized enclaves. Ghettoized societies give birth to populism, violence, and hate speech. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker from the United Kingdom, Baroness uh, Lucy neville -Lorf. I very much support the work by the European Commission on subsidiarity, proportionality, and doing uh, less more efficiently. And I'd like to make two points. First, I welcome the work on focus, on focusing resources on key activities, um, such as those we discussed yesterday. So, you know, uh, migration, climate change, digitization, so that our policy priorities can be implemented more efficiently and speedily. I've got business experience, I know that focus means success. Second, as at the Tallinn meeting, I wanted to support more transparency in decision making. And the letter before us today, uh, sent by the Netherlands and the Danish parliaments, um, because I think lack of transparency undermines faith in governments and in democracy. And if those who follow us are confronted with done deals, it's a big problem. It's a problem if this is done by governments, by the Commission, or by the Council. And we've seen that in last week's reaction in the UK to Brexit, um, and the concerns in 2016 over the lack of opportunity for national parliaments to discuss the allocation of our own resources. And there's no excuse, really. It's easy with the internet to consult. Um, we have pioneered at Lord's EU, uh, at, at Lord's EU our own uh, website uh, as a committee, 
And I so much agree with First Pres Vice President McGuinness's point about engaging early on policy with citizens and stakeholders. My experience of government as a civil servant, as a stakeholder, as a parliamentarian, and as a minister is that the sunshine of transparency is a good thing. Journalists flourish, flourish on allegations of secrecy and fake news, and we should not feed that. Thank you, Baroness. Next speaker, Christian Vigenin, Bulgaria. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Dear colleagues, uh, in the previous years, COSAC has contributed to reforms in the European Union through its active uh, involvement of the uh, uh, task force, uh, through its three participants and also thanks to the ideas it, uh, around which it was united. The first deputy uh, president of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, has committed to changing the rules within the framework of the possibilities under the treaty. A good sign of cooperation is that the fact that all uh, matters that Cossack put on the table for discussion uh, found their uh, place into the agenda. Uh, besides, uh, this uh, find its found its continuation in the communication of the Commission uh, last month. I would like to congratulate uh, the uh, Austrian Parliament and Reinhold Kopatka for the good work in this, uh, uh, on this. And I thank the presidency that they put the uh, subject of uh, subsidiarity and proportionality in the focus of their attention. Uh, Cossack's responsibility is great. We must uh, uh, defend what we, has achieved, we have achieved and we must uh, future, uh, further develop it. We must strengthen the coordination among us. We must try to be proactive uh, so as to defend our own pre uh, uh, claims and have a more um, legislative clout. We have gathered here the representatives of the national parliaments, and I'm sure that we hold the strongest uh, uh, voices in support of the European Union and its development. It, it's up to us to create the environment in which the elections will be held. The fact that most uh, people are disillusioned dis uh, and uh, have lost uh, confidence in politics uh, speaks for itself. Only if people feel that they're in the focus of attention, that they are in the forefront of decision making, would uh, we succeed. Uh, let us help citizens to uh, believe in us. Let us uh, uh, urge them to vote so that we have free and honest elections. Let us uh, make so that debates in uh, the uh, election campaign will be open and uh, we limit the fake news and anti-European propaganda. The Bulgarian parliament felt honored, and so did I, to serve um, uh, during the uh, first pa part of this year. I would like to thank our Austrian colleagues for the excellent cooperation. They continued. They took uh, uh, over the baton from us and continued work on some of our priorities. We had um, uh, very fruitful discussions in the two days of Cossack in Bulgaria. Uh, now the representation of Cossack uh, will return to our neighbor across the Danube. I wish them success. Thank you, Christian. Uh, next, uh, Simon Sidour, uh, France. For years we've talked about the fact that Europe has to get closer to the citizens, but if you look at the European project, that hasn't happened, and uh, it's more the way in which this is being implemented. Uh, we haven't really looked at the causes and we haven't really looked at the, the solutions. I think we have forgotten that Europe is not just an economic uh, entity where markets are De being developed and uh, free trade makes uh, progress. Uh, but how can people really see how important this is if they don't see the benefits of this movement in their own life, in their own existence? The social dimension, which is part of the European project, is very often forgotten. We talk about uh, the single market, but that doesn't really uh, go hand in hand with the social model for Europe. Uh, that means that uh, people can only move closer if uh, we have cohesion and solidarity. They play a major role in our territory, which is something forgotten. 
and uh, they make countries, uh, they give countries the possibility to catching up with the stronger ones, with the wealthier ones. And I think that that is something that should be taken on board in the next multi-annual uh, financial framework. I think the European project uh, has to be better understood and shared by citizens. And uh, in this respect, I have to say that solidarity doesn't really work properly. The Commission would have uh, to answer much more quickly and much more precisely to the arguments put forward by the national parliaments. For us, uh, it is a fact that the Commission very often uh, doesn't really hand uh, projects on to the national parliaments, uh, which is an infringement of subsidiarity. I very much regret that the task force hasn't taken a stand on this. The work of Mr. Timmermans really disappointed us, and one has to wonder about the efficiency of tools, uh, which at the moment mean that one-third of national parliaments and parliamentarians have uh, to even agree to a simple regulation as a legislative text. Uh, the proposals of the European Commission and the promises that we've made in the negotiations are, are really not fulfilled. There again, the need for more transparency is absolutely essential. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, from uh, Slovenia, Darek Rajcic. Yes, thank you very much. In a transparent European Union, well, it's one thing we need, but it's not sufficient. The lack of trust in politics seems to exist at all levels in Europe, whether at national or regional or local level. And this is reflected in the low turnout in elections, also to the European Parliament. Politics cannot make people happy. People can only make themselves happy. But politics takes over too much of the lives of these people. Hence, people consider that their happiness lies in the laps of these politicians. It's a sociological process. We have to say to these people that they have to take the responsibility for their own happiness. Yes, part of politics can provide solutions to complex problems, but that's very seductive because simple solutions don't then work. And what's more, all too often what's positive is, is considered to be a local success and what's unpleasant is considered to be an imposition nationally or from abroad. So this means that we need to depict the whole of the political structure, something positive, because on the whole it works well. And as we live at the moment in Europe, I think we consider everything to be uh, self-evident, but nothing in the world is self-evident. So I'm pleased that we can live at this level in Europe, and as long as we can, all is well. But when this conversation stops, then weapons will begin to speak. That was the case all too often in the past, because uh, it happened. Thank you. We Next need speaker, to raise Angel, awareness of this. Angel Dilva from Romania. Thank you. Thank you, President. And first of all, I would like to thank our panelists and for their wonderful speeches, Minister. Ms. Vice President, you have been very, very inspiring. And I would like to start by saying that Romania is committed to a positive attitude. We are pro-Europeans, we are inclusive and coherent, and we will contribute to the consolidation of the European project. We will act together on a European level to identify the best means and the best practices to reduce division and all the injustices and lack of equilibrium socially and economically. We sustain and maintain and are dedicated to the European integration and the European project. We appreciate the firm attitude of the European Parliament in this. And as far as transparency and increased transparency is concerned and uh, bringing the EU closer to its citizens, I am fully in agreement with all those who have spoken so far. We have to identify new methods to imply and involve citizens, to better communicate our objectives and our aims. 
In order to increase the presence of citizens and the participation at the elections is our shared goal and we all have to contribute to the realization of this. I would like to uh, remind you of the summit at Sibiu on 9th May 2019, and we need to raise the visibility of our activities in the eyes of our citizens. And this is why Romania uh, believes that it is crucially important to uh, strengthen the ties with our citizens and to give them information about how the EU works. Unfortunately, anti-European discourse is gaining terrain and we have to be firmly um, dedicated to attack, tackle and dismantle such uh, discourse. We need concrete action, we need concrete results, and we have to stop populism and extremism. And we are in this all together. Thank you very much for your kind Thank attention. Thank you. From Portugal, Isabel Pires has the floor. Thank you, Chair. We've heard a great deal in the So that certainly shouldn't be underestimated, but at a national level, we have a, a very important task before us in this area. We have to begin to make our debate uh, in a less bureaucratic and political way, because that puts our citizens off. So, with regard to the way the national parliaments and European Parliament work together, well, it's this political process. We have to address the present topics, the, the current topics. It's not about the mechanism. It's about looking at the troubles which have not yet been uh, dealt with. And I want to come back with what uh, Vice President McGuinness said. We really do have to look at the European interests of the citizens and communicate those. And we have to do this in a very serious way. We have to be serious and committed with respect to our processes. We have to make constructive criticism. And I hope that that means that the European processes and uh, developing the European Union, this has to be brought closer to our citizens. And in conclusion, the connection of the citizens, the connection of the citizens with what's going on at European, we can't really succeed unless uh, if we undermine solidarity and if uh, we don't shine a spotlight on solidarity. We have to develop methods which really solve problems on the ground in reality. And not next, uh, um, start Karakis things that we don't want to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. The European elections, which we will have very soon, are strategically very important, not just because of uh, the power situation that will evolve, but especially for the institutions in Europe and the political discussion that we see in all member states. So this has to be done in a constructive way and on a constructive basis. And we have to make sure that that happens, because otherwise all we will create is even more Euroscepticism. And if, if we look at the situation as it is already, many European societies have this Euroscepticism already as one of the consequences of the financial crisis. As far as Greece is concerned, 
What we are aiming at is to make sure that the, the Parliament uh, will play an important role in this discussion, so that the European project and the, the achievements and successes that uh, we have already made with it can be made clear. And uh, in order to do this, we would like very much to cooperate and work closely with other parliaments. Our aim is that, this, that the discussion about Europe should not uh, be developed within an interparliamentary conflict. No, it is our aim to make sure that the uh, European Union and what it has achieved as far as peace and uh, wealth are concerned can be shown. So, Charles, colleagues, a lack of transparency is uh, creates a perfect opportunity for populists. And so being close to citizens and transparency deserves our full attention with regard to creating acceptance for the European Union. If Europe is too far away from people, then we need to build bridges to the citizens. And these bridges are the various parliaments at different levels. And this is why in the, we need to strengthen the national and regional parliaments uh, in the European Union. A Europe of the regions has been talked about, a, a Europe of diversity. It, then this means that we have to emphasize this and the principle of subsidiarity is what will ensure this diversity. It will create closeness to the citizens and make it possible to have transparency. And so, of course, we welcome the report on the task force for subsidiarity and this task force set up by Jean-Claude Juncker, but the proposals have to be taken on board by the European Parliament in a positive way, uh, even if, of course, there's a space for improvement. The task force, uh, there's a clause uh, which was touched upon which is restrictive in terms of the single market, and the Commission has touched upon this issue of these horizontal competences, and this is problematic. Here we need clarity, we need clear allocation of competence, and we need to strengthen a decentralized Europe, a Europe of the regions. Thank you, Fimas. Uh, next, uh, from Estonia, Thomas Witzel. Thank you very much, President. Estonia is very much EU-minded, and our citizens support the EU. According to the Eurobarometer survey in October this year, um, membership of the EU is supported by 74% of Estonians. However, 76% of people in Estonia think that their voice is not heard in the EU. We've heard a number of important keywords today uh, concerning the issue of how to bring citizens nearer to the EU, uh, trust, openness, transparency, uh, about uh, what benefits the membership of the EU actually brings for citizens. But equally important is the connection of our policies to specific changes that they bring about in citizens' lives. For example, when we talk about migration, climate, or the financial framework, then it is of decisive importance for citizens whether they actually feel those changes in their everyday lives. And if the debates are carried out in a manner where no decisions follow the words, follow the debates, uh, and what is decided is not really implemented, that further contributes to the citizens not feeling that their voice does not count in Europe. 
Based on that, I have a proposal to COSAC to reform COSAC in a way that the topics we debate here and the opinions we reach, that they would have a more specific outcome on the EU level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Sergio Badelli, Italy. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to all the friends who are here. I think I wanted to say to our Dutch colleagues how important uh, transparency is and that we are as interested in having this as they are. We see that uh, the European institutions citizens, uh, have uh, really turned away from the European institutions. The European Parliament has to use its influence there. 500,000 citizens have not uh, received satisfactory institutions from the European institutions. It's uh, useless uh, to hide that fact from ourselves. Uh, today, is uh, there somebody who tries to do something about that? Let's think about it all together. We have insisted far too much on the, co the economy and not on politics, and that hasn't really helped the democratic deficit of the European Union and its institutions is quite clear, and uh, we haven't really understood, and citizens haven't understood what we're doing. If we want uh, to make sure that peace, uh, freedom, and the wealth uh, for which the European Union was created are fulfilled, then the citizens have to be brought on board, and they are more and more kept away from the European level. Transparency, therefore, is something that cannot wait. We have uh, different manifests on this, but nothing is being done. And uh, if we do something, it's far too small and only piecemeal. Direct democracy and digital democracy are things we talk about. Uh, the citizens uh, could be included here and could be brought much more into the processes. If we want uh, a real European house that all of us can live in, then we have uh, to be in line with what our founding fathers wanted and bring the Union closer to our citizens again, because this common house uh, lacks transparency and, and has all sorts of doors which are wide. Open. This is the only way in which we can build a union for our citizens that uh, is in line with their visions and their ideas of Europe. This uh, is why we have to make rules, uh, certainly, which are shared by everybody, but which are also equal for everybody. Thank you. Yes, distinguished colleagues, we see that this great doubt now in the in European institutions and populism and its forces exploit this deficit. And that some steps are not implemented with necessary energy, so we have to ensure that the situation changes by the time of the European elections. Citizens must see and feel the presence of the EU and their everyday life. So we need to revive trust in the European Union. In this difficult time we're going through, we know that citizens want and need a common European security and defense policy, and only in that way can we come up with answers to these simplistic populist uh, We need to be careful about how we go about this. We need to put these things to the fore. I come from a small European country where there is great instability in the neighborhood and where there is a great crisis at the moment in terms of human rights. So we must guarantee that Europe prevails here. We must ensure there is law and order. 
and secure our borders and human rights. And I would appeal that Cyprus Thank you. Next, uh, Gata be allowed Poland. to be an example for us in all of these areas. So, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, it's important that we find a recipe for getting citizens more involved and involved in uh, voting in the European elections. We want greater participation because what we see today is very low participation and this is very alarming. So, there are this fake news during the campaigns, this is part of the problem, and the EU has to be reformed so that it is not vulnerable to such activities. According to the polls, 87% of Polish uh, citizens are of the opinion that Poland benefits from membership of the EU, and that's, that's 20% more than the European average. We benefit from the CAP, from our single market, and from the cohesion funds. But at the same time, we are also critical as Polish uh, citizens of the EU, the Polish see uh, that they are handled uh, and less uh, treated less well on the uh, employment markets and that the CAP is not fairly distributed in all countries. So we want to have more uni uh, unity in the European Union. That is what uh, President Juncker said in his speech, we do not want the member states to be, to be divided into the good ones and the bad ones. We want to have a shared vision for Europe, and therefore it is necessary that we should always seek compromise. Of course it's difficult. If we want, however, that all member states feel equal and it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. Dibor Bana, Hungary has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Ms. First Vice Speaker, Mr. Minister, dear colleagues. The Brexit and the recent migrant crisis have shaken the citizens' remaining confidence in the European Union and its ability to solve and handle these issues. To re-establish the confidence of these people, the European Union has to be more transparent needs to solve issues which affect the citizens' everyday life and give more rights to member states where they can act more efficiently. We have to revise the term of subsidiarity. As an example, the yellow card procedure is not working like the way it should be. It should be a strong card in the hands of member states, but it is only as strong as the Commission wants it to be. Until subsidiarity is not a clear term for every player in the European Union, we can't expect that the citizens will feel like they are part of something bigger. However, we are responsible on every level to deliver the message of the European Union's importance. The institutions of the EU, the governments of the member states, political parties and NGOs have to emphasize that there are certain issues like the global climate change and the migrant crisis which can't be solved by individual countries. Thank you for your attention. Aus dem Europäischen Parlament, Otmar Karas, Österreich. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I have a request. Let's look at the forthcoming European elections, which are a key part of our debate. In six months' time, we will be paving the way for our next parliament. And Every citizen can take part in local, regional, and national elections. And we can also vote for MEPs. In just a few months, more citizens will vote for their parliament than there are inhabitants of North America. The only multinational parliament which is voted directly and which has the power to pass laws. That's our parliament. So I'd ask you to consider yourself ambassadors 
of the European Parliament. And it's important among the citizens of Europe so that we consider that the Parliament is not just about a reformation of the constitution of that, the composition of the Parliament, but we think further and ensure that the European Union remains able to act. And when we talk about subsidiarity, then we can make a lot of improvements, I know, but there can be more, there can be no body which better practices subsidiarity than the EU, because there's no European Union without the involvement of national parliaments and national governments and the directly elected MEPs. So when we say that Europe is distant, too distant, then we need to ask ourselves, why don't we say clearly that when it comes to passing of laws, the subsidiarity, and when it comes to our leading politicians, why shouldn't they be directly involved so they bear responsibility and not just blame the others? Because 93% of the EU budget is, felt, is actually spent in our municipalities and regions. Well, let's give a face to our common successes and make sure that we write common history together. Then we'll have a higher turnout in our elections. Thank you, Chairman. We are thinking how we could get uh, our uh, people back. We need to have the Vernim to vary to Nehaarata. And they need we need to have a European Uri Union on a free trade, uh, 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 human, human rights. The well-being of people is based on now we can uh, strengthen our competitiveness in the single market by promoting dig digitalization, uh, research and development, innovation technology, and by deregulation. It is also very important that we put our effort on education, uh, level playing field for students. It is a question of equality, age, child, and age, youth shall have the possibility to make it in their lives independently of the wealth of their parents. They need to be uh, included in their society and in Europe. Uh, um, economic policy that benefits people is good, and we need to, of course, uh, follow the stability pact and be responsible for our own economies. Uh, Tax evasion uh, is a prerequisite, uh, needs to be uh, 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 fought against so that people find this community a better and a more trustworthy union. Thank you from Montenegro, Ranko Kribo Kapi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Following Mr. Moser, I'll mention two big stars. One is Winston Churchill. And what he, what he told about Brexit when he spoke about Austro-Hungarian Empire. He told that's happening with big empire getting smaller and lost sense for consequences. Churchill told that about Austro-Hungarian Empire. Probably somebody could use that for the Brexit in the, in the present time. And the other big star is Barbara Pramer, former president of the Austrian parliament. We started together 2012 Children Democratic Workshops in Montenegro. Until now, past 21,000 young children across this program. They got the virus of the public interest. They got the virus of constitutionality, of reporters of the parliament. And that was the right initiative, right person, right time on the top of Austro Austrian parliament. Additionally, we established based on that uh, Children Parliament in Montenegro every year, two times when young children asking ministers question time in the Parliament. Together we started 2003, 
open parliament in Montenegro when NGO sector is participating in all committees in our parliament. All the time. It's more than 15 years now. And that's the way how we could be more desirable for the young generation to give them the virus of importance of the public interest and public awareness. Barbara Palmer has done it together with us in Montenegro. And it was the momentum to, to remind all of us on her achievements in the region. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, as uh, Minister Moser has to leave, uh, I would like to give him the floor now to intervene on the remarks uh, we heard so far. So, ladies and gentlemen, it seems from everything you've had to say that uh, Europe is alive and kicking, but that it's necessary that all of us make our contribution to greater transparency and to the rule of law, and that we have to work together in order to achieve that. But the problem that we're confronted with at the present time is that all of us know that we need the European Union, but we don't necessarily show why it's necessary in our everyday actions. And we don't necessarily demonstrate how useful it is. So, there, when you have a regulation, then it's not enough to agree on different levels. You also have to communicate it to the citizens. So, in advance, we have to involve our citizens. We have to explain to them why we need something. Why is this solution good? Or what uh, solutions are possible? So, what's been said by my Reed McGuinness is that we have to involve the citizens beforehand in the process so that it's clear for them why it is this issue can only be solved at a European level and why the European Union must be active. It's not just for the European legislative uh, uh, process, but also at the national level. And if we're too late with involving our citizens, then, then we won't be able to have their understanding for what we're trying to do. So, transparency, I agree 100%. I wasn't only the head of the Court of Auditors here in Austria for 12 years, but also with world, the, uh, involved with the Worldwide Association for all of the Courts of Auditors. With transparency, there are two issues that are important. One is the legislative process. It, it, you have to have a, a faster and um, more uh, a broader involvement of the citizens. We have to make it clear why we're using a particular legislative instrument. It's not enough just to have an input orientation. We have an output orientation. We have to know what it is we're doing with our money. And if we talk about the institutions, that we all have to give some thought to whether it's sufficient at the moment when you have the, with the European Court of Auditors, is it enough that over 50% of the resources are being used for a declaration of assurance in order to make it clear that something is being used in, uh, funds are being used in a proper way. But on the other hand, we don't know if that makes, actually makes any eco economic sense and whether this is economically efficient. So we all need to have, we all need to make verification of the economic sense of things. So we need to think about how we can address this problem, because after all, we can't answer that at this moment. And we all know that where there are errors, there are directives and regulations, and sometimes they're interpreted in different ways, and that also uh, leads to confusion and problems. So we need to make sure that the cost-benefit analysis is in place and we have to know that the money at the European level is being used in an efficient way. So that means that particularly given what's happened in the last few years and more and more expenditure has been taken to the European level, for example, because of the, um, the economic and, and uh, currency pact. So we need new control 
architecture in Europe. It's not enough just to have the Commission checking and the Court of Auditors checking and the national level checking and the local level checking. We need to have a architecture of financial controls with regard to the methods and the um, audit plans. We need to create a structure and the European Court of Auditors needs to give thought to how we can uh, meet these objectives. The colleague from Poland talked about us needing unity. Yes, that's true. And we talk about Europe, the European Union. It's not just about a, a fight going on between the, the Commission and the member states. It's about working together, uh, working together between the different member states. And we have to be clear about that, that we have to work together in order to create confidence, a mutual trust in each other. So it's not just about having trust in the Commission, but it's also about having trust between the member states so that we can meet our responsibilities. And this means we have a lot to do. We have this task to be transparent, and I support then all of the, uh, trans the initiatives from the Netherlands, and the Netherlands has always been, uh, has always stood for transparency. So it's not enough to just focus, however, on one institution, all of the European institutions. We have to be ready to inform our citizens and explain to them why we're doing certain things at a European level, why certain issues can only be resolved at a European level. So I try to do that as a Minister for Justice. I try to do that with my colleagues in the other member states. So with every dossier, to explain why this measure can only be brought in at a European level together with all the member states and why a national approach is not sufficient. And I think it's necessary that we all do that, that we can create more confidence in the European Union. And this is only possible if uh, it's only if we do this that we can take our responsibilities for the fu uh, future and fulfill them. So the sustainable development goals have to be fulfilled. And in order to do that, we have to think of in all of these areas whether our actions and the measures that we are uh, putting in place, whether this is a burden for the future or not. So in terms of the activities going on, because it's very important that we should not allow needs to go unmet in the present that uh, cannot be met in the future. So we have to look into the future. We have an eye on the future while we decide what actions to take today. And then we can have a functioning European Union, and it will be supported by the uh, citizens. I am a, a convinced European, a committed European, but we have to create the proper conditions for that. And I thank all of you, because all of your comments have shown that we're all working in the same direction, and I hope that we will be able to uh, achieve this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Moser. Uh, colleagues, we move on with our debate. Uh, next speaker, Ioannis uh, Kefalogiannis from Greece. Thank you very much, Chairman. I too would like to refer to one particular issue on relates to the democratic deficit and the lack of trust among citizens felt towards the European institutions. With a view to the forthcoming European elections, I think that we should and must resort to older practices. These are important measures which in the past haven't always proved successful. Sadly, it's often the case that citizens have low trust and they perceive a problem when it comes to decision-making. And this also relates to the decision-making by European institutions. Something needs to be done with regard to subsidiarity, hence the setting up of the task force. 
But something needs to happen. We need to actually put something into practice. We need action and not just hollow words. We must ensure that the costs of the bureaucracy in Brussels don't increase further. And at the same time, a witness that wages fall in individual EU countries, and we must ensure that the citizens of Europe turn out to take part in the elections. And if the parties are to turn out to stand and not just the existing parties and lists are to be deleted, or maybe we should ensure that the elections to the European Parliament don't take speaker, place at the same time as national or regional speaker. elections. I'd be interested in your opinion on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice. Uh, thank you very much of uh, the decreasing uh, confidence. Uh, but the problem relates to the increasing economic power of transnational institutions and banks. Uh, states are becoming uh, helpless due to the pressure of uh, enormous uh, uh, politic of, um, financial groups owning uh, uh, media and uh, NGOs. In Europe, uh, people are afraid of unbridled uh, uh, globalization. Uh, international corporations are no longer social and they are uh, gaining uh, their power. You, uh, the power of liberal culture is increasing to the detriment of traditional values. Uh, the role of national uh, countries and governments is waning. All these uh, signs of liberal globalization are often reflected or uh, attributed to the EU. That's why people are Eurosceptic, especially uh, weaker and poorer uh, working classes, which I, as a socialist politician, uh, do represent. Rich uh, elites uh, and rich people in uh, urban areas usually do support globalization, offering opportunities to them. But poorer people view globalization as a social threat. The EU EU often uh, forgets uh, about these people. That's why poor people are not, that's why the EU is not popular among uh, poorer people. Our le leader, uh, Dubček, used to spoke of European socially strong and truly uh, democratic European uh, and not a uh, neoliberal Europe. We should not restrict these issues to far right uh, or um, populism. The EU is uh, far away from uh, ordinary working people, and uh, left-wing politicians should draw attention to this. After the European uh, elections, everything will be different, and we have to get ready for that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think that to get citizens closer to the European Union, it would be necessary, first of all, to work to make sure that they have more simple, transparent and efficient mechanisms. One of the proposals that was aiming at that was the one that uh, was to give uh, real power and initiative to them, which we have to work for. Then we will have to come up with easier and simpler rules also as far as the management of in ultimo, European resources and uh, uh, last, we have to work on subsidiarity, the subsidiarity means that you choose the best, more efficient and best adapted level uh, to, to come up uh, with legislative act at the European Union, at the European Union, as uh, Mr. Moses said, uh, the European Union is supposed to give the efficient the citizens what they need both in politics, in the economy and in their social life. 
we have to get the best possible quality to make sure that we have national measures that uh, could be different between the member states, which is unfortunately necessary. Then there's security here. We have to work to make sure that we have a real European role to simplify and always improve the exchange of information and data between the various police forces and the intelligence forces to fight against uh, terrorism. Yesterday we talked about this and uh, I think we have to make it quite clear that uh, we have the same values for the member states and that we have the obligation to make sure that we come up with uh, decisions that once they have been approved are used as well and implemented as well for the moment, unfortunately, the member states or some member states very often still say openly that they don't want to, to do this. Also, we have to have uh, standards and uh, values that reflect what we believe in at European level. We cannot uh, live with the division here if uh, the union doesn't uh, make sure that uh, the values, the fundamental values can be complied with. The citizens do not understand this, and that goes for all laws, the, the civil ones, the human rights uh, laws, etc. We have to make sure that they are respected inside the European Union as well, and that is why we have to make our voice heard uh, that these values be really obeyed. If that is not the case, then the European Union might implore and uh, probably uh, will cease existing, which uh, is certainly not what is in favour of the future of our citizens. Thank okay. you. Rainer from Germany. Yes. Thank you for this conference, which has been very good in this aspect and in all aspects. We're talking now about trust, building up trust and being close to citizens. Now that presupposes that the EU in the next parliament will have a strong, effective budget from the very outset. From the very outset, and I welcome the declaration on 14th of November as regards the next multiannual prime, uh, financial framework. These are guidelines with which we can work. Now, the parliament's demand to at least to maintain the money for the cohesion of the structural funds, I think, are justified in order to ensure that weak structurally weak regions do not suffer and real progress would be the fund for the energy transition from 4.8 billion as recommended by the Parliament. We think this would be an appropriate answer to ensure that employers and local areas can get away from dependence on coal or carbon dioxide emitting sources. And it cannot be that the mines alone pay for this change. It's good that the EU wants to support people there and help people in mining areas. They too should be able to count on a fair partnership and together with the EU. Thank you. Thank you, Vilmaus. Many thanks. Uh, next speaker is Monica Hauganam. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much for raising this really important topic. Trust of people and the involvement of people, those need major steps because we've come so far with what we've done, but it's not helping us to move further. If we don't do anything, that would erode trust. The European Union cannot interfere in topics which do not have a pan-European importance. The parliaments of member states should have a more outstanding role, and there's also a need for more in doing less in the European Union, but doing more. Yesterday, we were discussing Brexit. Yes, it's like an alarm bell, which makes us ask, how did we end up here? The EU seems to be remote and something that restricts people's right to decide. People think that nobody listens to what they think, and that has a link to passive voters. I'm quite sure that the next European 
elections is going to be about people's trust. We have an enormous responsibility to explain why is the EU needed. We should not threaten people with the European Union and we should not always point the finger at the European Union if we want to find a scapegoat. What that means is um, fair treatment of all member states, big and small, and the same rules for everyone. For example, if we take agriculture, we often feel that there's no equal treatment of member states in agriculture. So, trust towards the European Union, it's not a given. We have to work really hard for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, Shira Kovel from Ireland. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll start by congratulating yourself. This is your second day sitting in the chair and your patience uh, in managing the speakers is to be commended. So thank you for that. I want at the outset to support my colleagues from Denmark and uh, the Netherlands with respect to more uh, transparency with the European Union. I'd also like to support my colleague from Estonia. I would like to see more um, teeth in the Cossack movement. I would like to see more of the decisions taken at Cossack uh, impacting. Now, colleagues, I want to talk about Brexit, Eurosceptics, transparency, rule of law, fake news, the rise of the populist, and cyber. We sitting in this room are responsible for what is going on. We have allowed new technology to come on board. I use Twitter. I'm told I use it more than Donald Trump. Uh, you can try that for yourself sometime. But we allow Twitter to be used to destroy political careers. We allow the rise of the populist, who doesn't have to put his name out or her name out, who can take a, a politician down in a couple of tweets. This is where Brexit came from. This is where all of the nonsense that we hear about Europe comes from. This is where the Eurosceptics draw their oxygen from. We must control social media, and if we don't do it, it will be to our detriment. I want to talk about trust finally, Chairman. 92% of the Irish people are supportive of the European Union. Yet, when we needed the European Union most, we were thrown under the bus along with our colleagues from Greece during the financial crisis. Why? To save ruthless banks who operated on the periphery or on the edge, who took chances they were never, ever, ever held accountable for. You threw our people into poverty and you threw the people of uh, Greece into poverty. And we allowed that to happen by not controlling the commercial activities of banks. And my final point today, uh, Chairman, is the drugs industry. I bring it up at every COSAC meeting. I can buy my drugs in Spain for a fraction of what I will pay for my drugs in Ireland. What is it that the drug companies have over the European Union that we cannot come up with a single price for a drug right across the entire Union? I think it's time that we started to look at a single market, meaning the price of a burger is the same in Madrid as it is in Dublin, Frankfurt, Berlin, or anywhere else. The same goes for the price of an aspirin or any other drug you care to take. Thank you once again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Microphone, please. Uh, Thank you, and I'd like to also thank the Austrian Presidency and the COSAC Secretariat for organizing an excellent meeting. I come from Malta, one of the smallest member states, but a country where we agree, where in 14 years of experience of, as members in the European Union, the EU has really made a positive difference in the lives of multi and Gotterton families. We're discussing transparency, subsidiarity. These are big words. But there are two faces to the same coin. Citizens want to be informed, and they have every right to be informed, to know what's going on in European institutions, including the European Council. And they also want to see that decisions that are taken 
actually produce good and benefits for families and youth. Let's not forget young people. Young people have dreams, dreams for their future. Then there's also a negative side to all of this. People think European institutions are remote. They control their lives, and, but they feel remote. It's true, decisions are taken and there is no accountability. So what must we do as COSAC? First of all, we need to trust each other. And we need to, first of all, require more information and more transparency from our institutions, European institutions. We need to be the bridge between our citizens and European institutions. And we also need more transparency, even at the European Council level. Who is taking decisions? These are persons who must be accountable to our citizens. And finally, we need to rethink our structures. We can't be involved in, the, in processes of decision-making when it's too late. The European Union is not our punching bag. It is the home of all European citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Jaroslav Paśka from Slovakia. Thank you very much, Chairman. Dear friends, we are speaking about the openness of the EU. Uh, we are speaking about its uh, transparency. And that at a time prior to European elections, uh, we want to make Europe better and, uh, um, and uh, something, uh, uh, um, uh, Europe being something that we have trust in. There are many examples of an arrogant uh, approach. Uh, uh, one of the, those was a decision, was a decision of the uh, European uh, Commission, infringement of Article uh, 7 uh, by Hungary. All of us are well aware of the fact that the Hungarian government uh, is strongly supported by its uh, electorate, uh, and uh, the vast majority of the um, Hungarian parliament supports the government, and it is a sovereign institution and uh, actually if something like this is happening uh, prior to the European elections uh, this uh, uh, infringement proceeding was uh, something that uh, uh, that was done uh, not at the right time and uh, definitely not at the right place. The European Parliament uh, is, uh, does not have any supremacy over Hungarian uh, Parliament. It cannot act as a policeman towards the uh, Hungarian Parliament. It seems that there are differences between uh, member states. Definitely in the approach to member states, we can see uh, differences. Uh, such acts of the European uh, Commission, European Parliament, towards such countries as Hungary, Poland, and uh, some others, this is uh, something that uh, acts as a big uh, challenge, uh, a challenge uh, that is faced by uh, the voters of uh, those uh, concerned uh, countries. And uh, uh, these uh, voters may really question whether they are to trust the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Alessandro Ciliovina. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, honorable colleagues. In many countries, and Italian is one of them, great disaffection is felt towards the EU. Brexit is simply the most evident example of the democratic deficit or the distance from its citizens and the lack of transparency, a union which is sadly more on the side of the banks than of that of politics, a union which is more and more distant from member states in Italy. It seems to me the right to let you know to tell you what I feel as a, an Italian MP is not just something I've read in the papers at the moment in Italy, while the governmental majority enjoys very positive feelings from the population, the hostility towards the European Union 
is very high at the moment because our country and our people more than ever feels left to its own devices by the European Union on, in things like immigration or our budget, which has been so heavily criticized by other countries and the European Union, or fake news and constant attacks on Italy. I repeat, Italy more than ever feels left to its own devices. We don't want that. This government majority is among the most, is among the youngest in the history of our country. We are the generation which was born during the EU, and we feel part of it. And we, it's part of our scenery. We want to think positively about it. The EU needs to take many, many steps forward. If it comes back to be felt as a union of the peoples and not of the banks. So this is what we hope for. And we hope to have a new majority, a new parliament, and a new commission. Thank you, President, and thank you, colleagues, for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, just a technical information. Uh, we have uh, the papers for the contributions and uh, conclusions on the table uh, in the rear. Uh, if uh, you don't have these papers already, please uh, feel free uh, to take them. So our next speaker is uh, from Romania, Gabriela Grezu. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, dear friends, today nobody does politics anymore. Everybody only administrates his, her personal position. Somebody once said, not myself. But I am afraid he was right. Politics is about the content, real choices, citizens' lives. Uh, defining interests, procedures are formal conditions to be fulfilled, not political solutions. I very much agree with uh, Mary McGuinness and all other colleagues stressing this before. The already long winter of our citizens' discontent has started when politics fail in providing results for everybody, when so-called output legitimacy made sense just for a few, not for all. Speaking too much about subsidiarity has at least two dangers. Firstly, nobody could ever define formal criteria to know what appropriate level of decision actually means. The approach, it is always political depending on the objective to be achieved, on changing realities, and our political will, not only on the treaties, and unfortunately, our endless competition, national, European. Uh, secondly, it represents a decent argument to be used by very populistic and nationalistic parties in order to undermine the common interest. Uh, transparency, it is good for us to control our own governments, we all agree. But for the common citizen, democracy, it is not about being able to know everything. It is about having capacity of acting and changing rules in order to have a good society to live in. Rule of law hardliners uh, forgot these realities many times. Some rules could be wrong, unrighteous, and they had to be changed. Rule of law without genuine democracy could be ma uh, dictatorship, actually. Think, please, at many financial rules and uh, austerity programs adopted and their effect on citizens' attitude against the European Union. And these rules have been very well enforced, very well implemented. Uh, but to be clear, democracy without rule of law could be mere anarchy, and we don't know this. We don't like this. However, very democratic. Time, madam. Sorry. No. Thanks. Next speaker, Bernard Durkin. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, our speakers this morning, particularly uh, our own uh, MEP Mairead McGuinness, for her very excellent uh, 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 presentation. She is one of the people who is the epitome of democracy. She travels throughout her own constituency and throughout the entire country in order to keep in touch with our people and to reflect their views and to bring them to the European Parliament. She also keeps equally in touch with the other member states uh, populations and their, their public in order that she might be in a position to reflect their views. It is on that that I want to reflect for a moment, if I might. And I have to say, and I'm sorry to disagree with my colleague in relation to the financial situation, a lot of distrust and unrest seems to have the evidence uh, with the, the, the European institutions now again. This has happened before. Uh, Lord Boswell spoke about this yesterday. It's not the first time it happened. But on every occasion that it's happened, it has always been on the back of economic unrest or financial crises. In respect of our own situation, we had our own central bank went to sleep. They didn't do their job. The ECB went to sleep, on which we were represented, didn't do its job either. And we would discourage those of us in, in domestic politics from raising the issues that were prevalent at the time and were obvious to the rest of us because it was alleged that we were going to cause a run and that we would exacerbate the situation. As it happened, we were right. I believe that we established a new credibility. We had no credibility. We had no credit anywhere. And the European institutions came to our aid and did not throw us under a bus because if they walked away then, we were finished. We are an open economy. We depend on those around us. We trade with all those around us. And we exist on the basis of our trade. And I don't accept the notion that yeah, the global economy is, is, is the death knell for the smaller countries and the poorer people. Unregulated, it may well be a threat. But there are regulations there, and it's up to us to observe them. The last point I want to make is, how much do each of us bring to the European table, the European project? We've been talking about this thing about bringing Europe closer to the people, bringing the people closer to, the, to Europe. What do we mean? Does it really mean that we, as individual members of the national parliaments and national, national countries, must we not take ownership of the European project ourselves? And that is the first instance. We cannot distance ourselves from it and pretend that it doesn't work because it's not in our favour. So we cannot be, be, be cherry-picking. We need to support the entire project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Marco Stein, Deutschland. Thank you very much, Chairman. It's obvious that in a system which is multi-layered, such as the European Union is, you always have to look at the, the best level on which you can take decisions and where these decisions can be most efficient and effective for European citizens. So transparency is essential if you want to have efficient policies. But when, while this is part of the acceptance, uh, it is equally true that you need uh, the honesty, and there I don't exclude ourselves or even myself as Germans, uh, we've always pointed our finger at Brussels. When something went wrong, we always said, oh, that was Brussels, even if uh, we were all involved. Uh, so I think that that is a dramatic mistake. If you are transparent, then as a parliament, you also have uh, to make sure, and that goes for me as well as for everybody else, to go down the road of transparency. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Always to say it's the fault of Brussels, uh, but uh, to have your own commitments and to be involved in the Brussels decisions doesn't work. We're a community of values, and then you have to accept that the parliament that is democratically elected says, dear friends, there are limits, and at the moment you are going beyond these limits. I think that is absolutely necessary if we want to keep Europe democratic. And I want to point out again, the next uh, European elections are some of the most important, maybe the most important we ever had in uh, the history of Europe. We all know why populist nationalists, etc., are on the way uh, to getting into the European Parliament, and that is why I want uh, to mention one of the biggest Democrats, our Chancellor, who said uh, that uh, 
democracy has to be achieved, but he said nothing is happening by itself and nothing or very few things last. That is something which uh, I want to give to all of us. If we want to have uh, democratic Europe, much, we have to fight for it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Many colleagues have emphasized the responsibility of national parliaments. Indeed, we can be the best ambassadors of European democracy as well, together with our colleagues from the European Parliament. But to do so, we also have to demonstrate to our citizens the value added when it comes to European issues. That's something, I think, which is not, has not yet entered the conscience of our uh, voters. But we also need to beef up this process of political dialogue with the institutions. So we also need the tools. These tools might be, for example, a right of parliamentary initiative, which is comparable to the right uh, of citizens initiative. Why is it inconceivable that when a third of MPs ask the European uh, Commission to legislate, why could we not oblige it to give reasoned decisions for not doing it? So if we MPs put this application, we have the right to do so within one year. This is one tool we can present to our voters. It would involve them, and then we would indeed have the means to intervene. Next speaker, Anthony Bettina, Malta. Chairman, I would like to also thank uh, all those involved in organizing this conference, especially the COSAC Secretariat, I would like to thank them. The promotion of transparency in the European Union is undoubtedly a very important step forward. However, when you speak to citizens on a national level, you realize that they are very skeptical they're very skeptical about the effectiveness of the European policies and if it really is defending the citizens' rights with regard to transparency and rule of law. It is time to now work hard not only to promote transparency and the rule of law, but also we need to prove with facts that um, the European institutions are being transparent in everything that they are doing. And also we need to show citizens that we are checking everything to make sure that every member state is implementing policies in a transparent manner and is being accountable to their citizens. Only in this way we can regain the trust of our citizens so that we effectively show our citizens that the European Union really cares about their its citizens. Thank you. Next uh, is Jaroslav Obremski. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, today we are talking about transparency, but yesterday we were we, we, we rejected the amendments put forward by the Netherlands, which wanted to increase or intended to increase in transparency. So this was uh, the representative of the European uh, Parliament, the European Parliament didn't send representatives to the task force either. So we talk about having saved uh, Greece, but more, it was more a question of saving the banks. And <coughs> Greece is uh, now on a very different economic level. So these are the results of a lack of, this all results in a lack of uh, trust from the side of the citizens in the European Union. And if we want to change this, then we have to, uh, we have to push through four 
important rules. So rights should not be politicized. The colleague from Slovakia said that we shouldn't have an influence on uh, independent elections. Jean-Claude Juncker, Juncker said that the rule of law procedure would not be initiated if it was about uh, if it was a, a large European country that was affected, and I think that's unfair. I think if a real rule is called into question, it has to be called into question everywhere in all states, member states, and. The independence of the judiciary may not be called into question. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Laura Castell, Spain. Thank you, Chairman. Dear colleagues, I'm from Catalonia, and Catalonia, as you know, has uh, had a referendum and is uh, certainly trying to contribute to a Europe that is much more transparent and uh, that upholds the principles of uh, Democracy, that is why we have uh, a law that says that we do not uh, admit any lobbying and uh, that we want to be transparent. Uh, therefore, we are one of the main parliaments uh, which in Europe could be chosen as a reference point for transparency. That is how we continue in the construction of a free public space where we can discuss and express ourselves in line with the best European traditions. Last uh, week in the Parliament in uh, Catalonia, we gave the green light to a new law which uh, wants uh, to have full transparency for competition and for everybody to participate. But, dear colleagues, all we need, uh, we, we need a transparent uh, Europe, but we also need a Europe that is close to the citizens, and that is why we have to respect the popular wishes, the wishes of our citizens, so that we have a democracy of quality. 80% uh, of uh, the Catalan population want uh, to decide their own future. We want to vote democratically, freely, and in a very civil way. And the European Union and the member states do not support us in this. And uh, that is why they call themselves uh, democratic, and that is why we're in a time where nationalist movements are being tolerated uh, in Spain and in other members, uh, and uh, that is why those who have been elected democratically uh, were not able uh, to continue in their functions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Renske-Leiten is our next speaker. When we talk about this meeting, this is all quite remarkable. We're elected members of parliament. We keep our own governments in check. And here we gather together to see to it that in the European Union that we make, we do the same. Now we're talking about the European elections. Elections are all about trust, but also about hope, hope for change. And what do we see? That hope may also stem from being willing to hold accountable those in power that did not serve the interest of the people. I think we all share that analysis. When we talk about a Europe that protects, that is transparent, I think it would be a good idea to put our own strength in that debate and analyze that as well. Because for people, what counts is what is close by, what is recognizable, what they can identify with, the language, culture. It's been said before, the turnout, we see that in the Netherlands as well, is a lot higher for the national elections than they are for, than it is for the European elections. So I see a task ahead of me to explain to people what Europe stands for. I'm one of the people, along with Peter Omzicht and Martin van Rooyen, who set up this initiative around transparency. And I'm happy to see that after a year, we found a form of cooperation with the Danes 
Also, Italy and the Czech Republic are with us now, and Ireland expressed its support. So I'd like to give the floor now to my colleague, Peter Omtzigt, who will tell you all about the further steps we want to take to use the strength of parliaments and enforce transparency at the level of the European institutions. Thank you very much. Uh, he was our first speaker in the debate. He will be the final one, uh, Peter Omtzigt. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, I would like to thank, um, on behalf of the Dutch States General and the Danish Folketing, the Danish Parliament, for your support. We've had explicit support from Italy, from Ireland, from Malta, from Poland, and quite a few other countries, from Sweden, from Mr. Moses. Um, this means that we need some follow-up action, and that could be that we ask similar questions to our government. So I would invite you to vi find me during the coffee break, which we have, or to find Renske, or to find Martin, and that we exchange addresses and make sure we hold our own governments accountable when they go to the council. So as long as the council doesn't change its procedures, we can ask them every time to give us exactly the voting results and the results of the discussion. That way, we, from this COSAC, make a real um, progress in making the European Union, and especially the Council, more accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, final remarks uh, by uh, Madam Vice President of the European Parliament, Marit McGuinness. Thank you, Chair. I have just run out of note paper, so it is just as well we had our final contribution. Um, let me challenge you a little because there's a running consensus here that greater transparency will be the answer to all our ills. I'm afraid I don't believe that that is the case, although I do support the uh, approach for greater transparency. Let me also say that I did not hear very much about implementation of EU legislation, which is in your hands at national level, but very often is not delivered. And therefore, I do think that national parliaments have a greater role in making sure that we implement effectively EU legislation. My third point uh, in relation to politics generally is that we are now in a society where it is about individual opinion is my politics. Uh, we are moving away from support for traditional parties towards groups that say what I feel. And the danger of supporting groups that say what I feel individually is that there is an impossibility for collective action and appropriate uh, forward-looking legislation. I would also say that populism began in the member states. Europe gets blamed for its um, expansion, but its roots are in the member states. I fear that in the European Parliament elections that our citizens take perhaps greater chances at European elections and support um, either individuals or parties that are not of their normal center-right, center-left or approach. Um, and therefore, we are concerned about the makeup of future European parliaments because we may find ourselves unable to agree on anything and therefore be a very neutered parliament. We have seen in the past where uh, the European Parliament provides an excellent democratic platform for people to attack Europe and indeed to try and pull it down. Democracy has its positives but also its negatives. We should be aware of that. I would like to address some of the points, for example, on subsidiarity and the eight weeks notice for reasoned opinions. The Parliament, the European Parliament supports um, uh, you in this respect. On the point where um, subsidiarity and where we should answer the, the questions and problems of citizens, I would just note that many citizens, when they find their member state government or institutions unwilling or indeed unable to help them, they turn immediately to the European Union institutions for help and support and very often find it there. So the member state is not always the best when it comes to dealing with citizens directly. I agree with the French colleague who talked about the need for more talk about the social dimension to the European Union. 
But in that, we also need to speak openly to our citizens about the reality that the European Union is best in class when it comes to delivering on many of these issues. Our challenge for the future, not for our generation, but for my children and their children, is will we be able to maintain this same level of social supports in a global world which is under threat and under, under ch a great challenge? Um, in relation to uh, comments um, generally on uh, you know, Europe and how we address it to our citizens, I think we should, when we talk about the European Union, also speak about if it did not exist or indeed disintegrates, what then? Because too few of us have this conversation with ourselves or indeed with our citizens. Um, an Italian colleague mentioned that uh, citizens uh, in Italy are turning away from the institutions. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure I can agree fully. I also think that there is a dangerous politics which uh, feeds this idea that citizens should have less trust in the institutions. And that's a gamble we should be careful of, of taking because uh, institutions are not perfect, but we cannot function effectively without them. Um, I, I hear the comments around certain policies uh, and different views within member states. On globalization generally, Europe has responded with our globalization funds, but it is also true to say that for many of the poor in the world, um, globalization has been very important to lift people out of poverty globally. We perhaps in Europe have not had the appropriate responses where globalization has impacted on particular sections of our society. But we have to look at the overall that globally, uh, um, globalization rather has been a helpful uh, tool in terms of poverty alleviation uh, at that level. Um, I suppose uh, when I hear that hostility to the European Union is very high, as another colleague, I think an Italian colleague mentioned, I would ask you to be careful not to fuel that hostility. I think it can be quite attractive to have a bogeyman or an enemy, um, whereas the member state is great and the European Union is not. And I'm very appreciative of those colleagues who spoke about that we are all perhaps guilty of framing Europe in that context. You know, it's a very simple construct with a complex way of operating because of the size we are today. It's about countries deciding voluntarily to work together. I find nothing wrong with that. I think it can be very difficult for us to move forward together at a pace that citizens understand and appreciate. But I would find it very difficult to say in, at some future time, if we were guilty of allowing it to disintegrate, that I was there when it happened, that I was part of that process of weakening something which people fought and died to construct. And I was very um, taken yesterday by, by one of the UK colleagues who very rightly spoke about the UK contribution to fighting evil moments of the past and supporting Europe uh, through the wars, out of which the European Union took its roots. And to some extent, I wonder if there was in transparency at 100% level at those moments when our forefathers, and indeed let's mention our mothers as well, we're talking about pulling together and creating the first vestiges of the European Union, it might not have happened at all. Because sometimes in politics we need space amongst ourselves for reflection before we then open out the conversation. And I think that's what's missing in politics today. There is no quiet space where politicians can reflect and consider and change our minds without being attacked by one group or another. Chairman, this has been a most fruitful engagement. Um, I have co collected and gathered all of your comments and will feed them back to my colleagues in the European Parliament. Whereas I would repeat on transparency, we vote this week in the AFCO committee on the Ombudsman report uh, on transparency at council level. So you have a good friend and ally uh, in this uh, quarter. My deep appreciation to my Austrian colleagues for putting this format together and having a full room at the end of the conference. It is not always achieved. So my compliments to you for that and my appreciation for those who t took a similar view to me. It's always nicer to be supported. 
but also a deep appreciation of those who did not. The most important thing that I have learned in my career in politics is to be able to listen to everybody and not to shut our ears to those who take a different view. I think that is always the danger. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Merit, uh, for your commitment. Uh, it is a joy to work together with you and the European uh, Parliament. Uh, and I would also like uh, to take the opportunity to thank uh, all uh, members of uh, the COSAC uh, planet, uh, plen plenary meeting for this uh, positive uh, working uh, together and for the debates we had uh, on Monday and uh, today. It uh, was uh, rather impressive uh, for me and an honor to chair this uh, COSAC plenary meeting. Uh, thanks a lot for this good cooperation and I would like now to hand over the chair to our colleague Reinhold Lobatka. Yeah, dear colleagues, after more than 150 interventions on these two days, all in all, we are coming now to the final session of our meeting. Yesterday, during the chairperson's meeting, we achieved consensus on the draft conclusions and contribution of our meeting. And the agreed text has been uh, sent to you. And I would like to thank you, all of you, for the constructive debate. It was a long debate uh, yesterday and for your input. And so if there are no comments, we consider the conclusions and contribution of the 60th Cossack to be officially adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so we consider, sorry, and now I'm coming uh, to the draft uh, contribution. Are there any comments? No, thank you very much. Yeah. So all of the contributions are adopted. And now, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to thank all of you for attending uh, the meeting. And yeah, as it was mentioned by Christian Buchmann, your active participation. Furthermore, I would like to thank all the people who were involved here, in particular the interpreters, the Cossack Secretariat, the administration of the Austrian Parliament. Sorry for the inconvenience yesterday at the beginning, but I think uh, except this, uh, the technicians were also uh, excellent. So now, uh, <laughs> Now, before we close our meeting, uh, I invite our friends from, sorry, before we close our meeting, I would like to give the floor uh, to Ms. Grezzo from Romania, from the Romanian Senate, uh, who will be taking over the Cossack presidency in the first half of 2019. Uh, please, Ms. Grezzo. Thank you very much, President, and we thank and our thanks to everybody, to, to everybody and all who were involved and during the Austrian presidency for allowing this excellent framework for debate, even when we did not agree one with another, which is of course natural in politics. We are ready, we are prepared to take over the presidency for the very first time. And maybe this is why we would like to be even more involved, even better motivated to organize excellent and good, high quality political debates, including a parliamentary conference concerning the future of the EU, of the European Union, 
preparing in preparation of the summit at Sibiu so that we all can have our input and convey the input of our citizens. We await you with open arms on the 20th and 21st of January in Bucharest for the reunion of the presidents of the committees of European Affairs. Thank you. You are awaited. You are welcome. I have only uh, wished a very good political year for all of us in 2019. Thank you, thank you very much. And so next time the chairpersons uh, will meet in, in, in Romania and then we have our big meeting in, in June on the 23rd to 25th of June in a palace, in the palace of parliament. Uh, in uh, Romania, in Bucharest.